My name is Neil Katyal and I'm a partner at Hogan Lovells and a law professor at Georgetown. So my parents really didn't, wanted to keep me away from any sadness. So they re tried really, really hard to um, insulate me from any of their own difficulties, be it economic or racial or whatever. You know, so for example, I only recently learned, I mean by last week, recently learned that my parents moved to our neighborhood with one other Indian family. And when they moved there, there's actually a cross that was burnt on their lawn. And I didn't know that because my parents really didn't want me to know any of that kind of um, stuff. But, you know, I think at that time, you know, distinguishing between Hindus and African-Americans probably wasn't the racist strong suit. And so they just figured burn a cross. I mean, quite honestly, when I went to law school, my parents cried. Um, and really cried. They bawled. They hated lawyers. They basically thought lawyers were all a bunch of jokesters and corrupt people. And they, like I suspect many people in the audience, wanted me to be a doctor. They'd basically given me a car if I applied to a six-year medical combined program. And I turned down the car basically and decided not to do that. Um, after my senior year of high school, but open the idea, was open to the idea of being a doctor at that point. Um, but one thing that happened to me, a kind of fork in the road, was I joined the debate team. Actually, my parents had pressured me to join the debate team, and I wound up loving it. And I was a shy kid, I was like a science geek, and I wound up realizing, wow, the power of speech, the power of ideas, and I just fell in love with it. And so I did it all through high school and college in a pretty serious way flying around the country starting as a sophomore in high school. And that, I think, really um, launched this other career. And so, you know, I went to law school, but even when I went to law school, I thought, you know, I was really interested in teaching. Many people ask me, Neil, you have the best job in the world. You get to argue all of these cases in the United States Supreme Court. Why are you still doing this teaching thing at Georgetown? But to me, the answer is very simple. I mean, teaching is the greatest privilege one can have. The idea of inspiring the next generation of people to fight for what they believe in and to use the power of the law to try and come back to our Constitution's ideals. Well, I think the most central calling of an attorney is to fight for those who lack a voice. So it really upsets me when someone, whether it's a powerful person or the most marginalized person, can't get representation. I think that's, you know, central to what our profession is about, is defending the voice of those who lack one. Um, I don't think that's just unique to my background. I think that's true about the profession generally. But I do think growing up the way I grew up, hearing ultimately the stories that have happened to my parents and other people does impact the way in which I, as an attorney, use my resources. I do think that we should use the law toward advancing our Constitution's goals and no central goal, no goal more central than e pluribus unum out of many one. And the idea that our country really truly is trying to take the best and brightest from around the world and give them opportunities. What gets me going is the extraordinary privilege of someone coming to you and saying, Neil, I need you to speak for me at the United States Supreme Court. And that someone could be the lowest of the low, the guy who's Bin Laden's driver, or it could be the fancy corporation that says, we got a lot at stake. Both are meaningful. It's not just one, both are. Um, because you see yourself as part of a arc of justice, the court's trying to get it right, and it's not always that the little guys got it right or that the big guys got it right. It's that, you know, it just depends on the case. And what a great, extraordinary opportunity to be able to, you know, make that case before the same group of nine that, you know, I'm constantly before. So it's um, a repeat kind of interaction. And as you know from game theory, you know, repeat players, you know, tends to bring out cooperation and kind of the best in people. I cannot tell you how many meetings I'm in, in New York and DC or LA, in which, you know, big cases on the line um, with 15, 20 law firms in the room, sometimes the clients as well. And it's usually 60 old Caucasian men. There's one woman usually, and that's my woman partner that I'll bring, um, and everyone is white.
Um, and that's true right now in 2017 in virtually every big city in America when you get a big legal case um, and all the lawyers in a room. How dispiriting is that? Sure, at our law schools, our proportion of women, the proportion of minorities is quite good, certainly compared to when I went to law school. But at the senior ranks of our profession, doesn't look anything, anything like that. And so, yes, I think it is deeply important that the next generation be pushed forward. Um, and that's of women and of minorities. I mean, I look at the U.S. Supreme Court where, you know, really only 20% of oral arguments today are done by women, largely women in the Solicitor General's office as opposed to the private bar. You know, I run the only appellate group that is half women, um, I think, in the whole country. Um, and that's not where we should be. Well, I, I went to Napaba, I think, probably right right after law school or something like that. And then when I was at the Justice Department uh, my first time, I was uh, Eric Holder's special assistant when the president asked us to put together a uh, group of uh, leading members of the bar to talk, focus on diversity in the profession and pro bono. And the Napaba um, president was so involved in this and so active. And it really got me open to the idea of wow, Napaba can be a real force. I mean, everyone always thinks about, you know, the Hispanic Bar Association and other bars, but wow, Napaba's really got something. I think the law is a tricky profession. I think a lot of people go into the law because they're not sure what else to do. Um, and they tend to be conformists because they see other people going into it. And so they see it as safe. And I think, I think that's a real mistake. I think the glory of the law is actually to take the path that other people aren't taking. I mean, my whole career as a lawyer was launched by taking a case that nobody thought to take, which was defending bin Laden's driver at Guantanamo. And it's that that launched the representations of the Exxons of the world or whatever. Um, and so, you know, the path is not a linear one. And if you just follow the crowd, I, I actually think it's not just hard to stand out, it's just not that satisfying as a lawyer. So taking the cases that speak to you in your heart, I think is the really the only way to be a good lawyer.